today I'm going to be talking about um, living life less plastic and um, a little bit about sea turtles first because as Dory said I worked for the Virginia Aquarium um, Stranding Response Program. I started as a volunteer in, in 1997 on their whale watch boats and um, then went to a, a um, meeting about the stranding team and saw the pictures of the animals and, and you know what humans had been doing to them and I couldn't help myself so I joined the stranding team and I was hanging around there all the time and then the fishes department finally said well we, you might as well get paid for this so they hired me to um, to uh, help collect fish for the aquarium and then eventually I got hired on with the stranding program and I think actually my next graphically interesting slide there is um, <laughs> <laughs> so why I'm here and how I got to this place, this is kind of my resume rundown life story history. I actually grew up in Westerly, Rhode Island, um, near Musquamacate Beach. So I am a New Englander, um, but I went to Western Carolina University and very quickly lost my Rhode Island accent because if you've ever been in the South or somewhere where you don't have a, an accent, they quickly want you to say all these different words. So I got rid of it. Um, <laughs> again, I started working with sea turtles in 1999 and, and uh, Connie here, from New England Aquarium, was involved with the cold stunning event of 1999 and sent us a whole bunch of sea turtles and that's when we really started doing um, sea turtle rehab at the Virginia Aquarium. So um, Connie and I go b way back and Eulika also, um, so we have some New England Aquarium superstars here. <laughs> um, over time, I mean, my degree was in business management, so, and now I'm working with sea turtles, so it took me a little while to become an expert on that one. Um, and I, I quotate expert because I don't really, there's so many people out there that are so much smarter than me with sea turtles, so, um, but I, I know, I know enough. <laughs> um, in 2003, I started, I found out about the International Coastal Cleanup, and um, that year I got really excited about it and, and led three cleanups, and then the after that I would do one a year, because um, that was a lot, but um, just seeing, doing stranding response, when you're going out and um, collecting these stranded animals, and we we're going out to barrier islands, national wildlife refuges, all these places where there really is no human, you know, humans hanging around and they're just trashed. Um, and that's kind of why I got involved in the beach cleanups. And in 2008, true story, I was in the back of a van with a bunch of sea turtles and um, one of the people that was back there with me had a um, reusable shopping bag that had one of the grocery store names on it and I was like, you know, I bet a lot more people would carry grocery bags if they weren't boring and ugly and, and advertising for a grocery store. So I called my sister that night and I said, I need some designs. We're going to make some reusable shopping bags. And she said, uh, okay. And <laughs> um, I got online and researched the different bag companies and bought a bunch of bags and, and printed them up. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then I started the Old Beach Green Market, which is an eco market in Virginia Beach. And I've met all these awesome people that um, love to be green and love to recycle and reuse. Um, and then I've, over the time, just gotten involved in all these local groups, Project Green Teens. It's a group of local teenagers, um, when I say local, I mean Virginia Beach, that um, are doing awesome things for the environment. They're doing beach cleanups and, and fun things like that. Um, Virginia Beach Clean Community Commission, it's a, um, a uh, city council appointed position. Um, I'm going to talk about the Virginia Balloon Study, the Virginia Marine Debris Study, and then Surf Rider Foundation Virginia Beach Chapter just made me their Director of Environmental Affairs. Um, so that's kind of cool. And yes, that's me, just in case you weren't sure if that was me behind the Mickey Mouse mask, a balloon mask. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, and I like sea turtles. <laughs> I can't help myself. Um, they're such charismatic, um, interesting, and for the size of their teeny tiny brains, they're incredibly smart and intuitive. And, and some of the things, like these little guys down on the bottom, the little hatchlings, when they're born, they're like literally this big. And they know to go to the ocean unless there's light pollution. And then, and then they swim right out to the Gulf Stream. And they spend their years out there. And, and they, know, they just know what to do. And, and a lot of these animals are coming back 20, 30, 40 years later to their neonatal beaches and laying eggs again. Like, how do they even do that after thousands of miles and years? So they're just really fun creatures. And I think um, that they are becoming more popular, if you will. Um, that's our King Neptune statue uh, on the Virginia Beach boardwalk down there on the bottom. And he's holding a sea turtle, I think. The turtle is guiding him. I was given the opportunity to go to New Orleans and pa Panama City Beach during the um, 
oil spill in 2010 and work with sea turtles down there. Um, and that was just an eye-opening, amazing experience. And I'll never forget it. And I'm so proud to have been able to, to work with these animals. In New England, you have four species, and that pretty much goes almost all the way down to Florida, four species of sea turtle um, that exist in our waters off our coast. The leatherback sea turtle is not just the uh, largest sea turtle, but it's the largest reptile. These guys can grow up to 2,000 pounds, and they survive on jellyfish. Um, the loggerhead sea turtle, um, they can grow up to 300 pounds. They're just amazing critters, and that's one of the, um, that is the most prominent turtle in Virginia. Um, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle is the most endangered of all the sea turtles. Um, those guys are making a comeback, and a lot of that is because of changes in commercial fishing, and especially in the Gulf, um, with the turtle excluder devices on shrimp trawlers. So they are making a comeback, but they're still considered critically endangered. And then the green sea turtle, which sur survives as a vegetarian as an adult, and uh, they can grow up to four or 500 pounds. I actually got the opportunity to pull a 300 pounder through a tuna door in the back of a sport fishing boat one time, with diesel fuel in my face, um, trying to rescue her. So they can get quite large and quite angry. Some threats to sea turtles. Um, there are a number of threats. Uh, the, the figure is that sea turtles, um, for every thousand turtles that hatch out of their nest, one will survive to adulthood to reproduce and make more sea turtles. A lot of that's natural. It just is what it is. Um, you know, when they get out in the water, they're this big, so they're like little snacks for the bigger fish. Um, but as they grow, they're running the gamut of anything that could be out there, um, commercial and recreational fishing. Climate change is a big one that people are keeping, scientists are keeping an eye on. Um, sea turtle nest, um, their sex uh, determination is determined by the temperature of the nest. So as climates warm, we're going to get more and more females and less and less males. So, um, you know, that's definitely something to keep an eye on. And, and it'll be interesting to see if sea turtles start nesting further, further north to adjust for that. Um, vessel interaction. Virginia Beach, that's a huge portion of the number of strandings that come in as um, animals that have been hit by um, boats of all kinds, big propellers, little propellers. Environmental contamination, um, runoff, you know, we've got algae blooms and, and who knows what's going on out there. There's just so much junk that we're putting into the ocean these days and, and everything, you know, sea turtles kind of can reflect what's going on in the ocean. And when you have all these diseased animals coming in, the, um, you know, that, can, that should be red flags going on, going off everywhere for everybody. Um, destruction of habitat. These animals have to come up above the high tide line to, to lay their eggs. When people are building um, you know, storm walls and doing beach replenishment and just changing the face of the beaches, then we're changing their habitat and we're changing the way that they reproduce and, and how they live their lives. Um, and again, I've already mentioned disease. Um, there's a few different things out there that are affecting sea turtles, um, especially um, in the southern states. And um, Hawaii has a big problem with tumors and sea turtles. So. But what I'm going to talk about, after all that pleasantness, um, is marine debris <laughs> and how marine debris um, can actually affect sea turtles and then um, how all of us can do little tiny things and little changes in our lives to, to make a difference and to help these animals and all the animals, everything that's living on this planet. They all deserve our respect and um, you know, little life changes to, to make a difference. Okay, so I started my company in about March of 2008. In September 2008, this little green sea turtle stranded in Virginia Beach. He was so underweight. You can see on that top left picture that little bone that's sticking out that shouldn't be like that. Um, so our crew did some x-rays, and on the top right there you can see um, it's called a barium series where you kind of light up the, the intestinal tract and take x-rays so you can see what's going on. That, that's the esophagus that's highlighted there, and that esophagus is about three times the width that it should be. So um, we went in with our veterinarians, and they did what's called an esophagoscopy, <laughs> and they started pulling out trash. Um, and it had all lodged in his throat. Now sea turtles have this really cool thing going on in their esophagus. It's these little papillae and they point downward toward the stomach. So especially when you're eating jellyfish or something slimy, it can't come back up. So sea turtles really have a hard time regurgitating. Um, so this guy had all these little bits and pieces of trash that had gotten stuck on those papillae and he wasn't able to swallow them. Because a lot of times little tiny pieces can actually pass through. 
Um, so that, we call it is trash collection. They had to do three procedures to get everything out. Um, on the top right on that picture, you can see that there's actually five different pieces of latex balloon, five different colors. There was just all these little pieces of soft plastic, you know, could have been from plastic bags, um, you know, any kind of film or anything that might have been in the water, some kind of weird plasticky mesh. And then what's labeled newspaper, we figured out later, was probably part of a, an instruction sheet, because on one side it was in English and on the other side it was in Spanish. Um, so, you know, just little bits and pieces um, in this animal's throat. Let me tell you, after we got all that cleared up and he got all his muscles working again and could finally start swallowing again, we had to put him on a diet because he got so fat. He was so <laughs> hungry, that poor guy. And he did get released and we were able to um, track him. We put a satellite transmitter on him and, and tracked him, um, I think, down to South Carolina before the batteries died. All right, so green sea turtles, like I said, they're vegetarians. These animals are feeding on sea grasses. They're on the bottom, they're on the top, they're in the whatever's floating around. Turtles don't know what is good and what is bad. They know what they're supposed to eat, and if there's something in the mix, they just don't get it. So with a green sea turtle, they're eating the sea grasses. Oh, you can imagine if there's any kind of little bits and pieces of litter in that sea grass, well, that's just going in with whatever they're eating. Um, I remember one year we had all these green, little green sea turtles that were stranding and they were all coming up with these little teeny tiny bits of trash in their stomachs. And it's probable that they would have passed them, they probably died from something else, but the fact remains they shouldn't have trash in their bellies. Um, you can see on the top left uh, Reese's peanut butter cup wrapper. Um, and then there's a couple of pieces of balloon and some soft plastic. And, um, you know, all these guys had little teeny tiny bits of plastic in their bellies. Plastic, when it gets out into the environment, it can break down into smaller and smaller pieces. It doesn't go away. So when, it, when it's running around with the currents and the seaweed, then it's just getting all caught up in the mix. So the green turtles are kind of, um, you know, susceptible to that situation. Sea turtles love jellyfish, not just the leatherbacks. But all sea turtles seem to like jellyfish for whatever reason. Um, the leatherbacks eat the most, obviously. Um, I think the figure I heard was about 500 pounds of jellies a day. So we like leatherbacks. <laughs> so here's the problem with other types of trash in the ocean. You have those big giant moon jellies and the leatherback is out there and he's trying to feed on his moon jellies and he's having a good old time. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, that's not a jelly, but it's too late already in that papilla, it's already going down the throat. And you can see just from that what might have, you know, how they might have made that mistake. You know, it all looks the same when you're a leatherback in the ocean or any kind of turtle. <laughs> I think some of you have already seen this. I have the bag and the shirt. <laughs> this is a design by my sister. Um, one, one of the things after we had done those original bags is that we wanted to do some fun stuff. And um, so we called these guys the Vengemals. They're very angry. What are we doing out there? <laughs> so, um, okay, this is my pet peeve. Ask anyone that knows me. <laughs> I actually saw balloons on 495. Once I tell you this, you will see them everywhere. Because once you know that this is an issue, <laughs> all of a sudden your, your eyes are open to it and there's just balloons everywhere. They're in trees. This one was just on the side of 495. It was a mylar balloon. Drives me nuts. Um, balloons are a very unique form of litter. And um, one of the reasons I say that is people actually go to the balloon store, or the florist, the party store, whatever. They buy this piece of um, latex or um, plastic with plastic strings. They buy these things for the purposes of littering them. And in most states it's legal. It's legal litter. Um, the state of Virginia right now has a law that says you can release up to 50 balloons or no more, no more than 50 balloons at a time within an hour, uh, one hour period. Um, there's no, nothing that says they have to be, um, you know, if it's under 50, they can be any material, any attachments, anything. This is actually, I think, False Cape State Park, um, which is the southernmost, well, probably one of the more re remote beaches in Virginia Beach. You can see it's just littered with balloons. Balloons don't actually go to heaven. We're finding that out because we're finding the notes on the balloons still on the beach. Um, and that's a, it, it probably sounds like a very cruel thing to say because for a lot of things that is a release. 
it is a way to communicate with the loved ones that have passed. Um, but it, the reality of it is, is when they're doing that, they're littering. Um, all right, so balloons is litter. Um, this is another one of those impressive graphics, I hope. <laughs> Jelly, mylar balloon, very easy to mistake it. These are latex balloons. So there's actually a balloon council. It's this big giant balloon industry thing and they protect the balloon industry. We're not saying don't buy balloons. What we're saying is stop letting them go. Um, research shows that when these latex balloons hit an altitude, they explode into tiny little pieces and they go away. Um, unfortunately, if they don't actually go away, which I don't think they actually do, um, they come back down and they can mimic something that we're all very familiar with um, and that animals out in the ocean like to eat. And these are all photos that I've taken. Um, we go out and we do balloon walks. We are picking up on some islands up to 150 balloons per mile. This little guy just came in, just came in at New England Aquarium um, with a big, long balloon string hanging out of its mouth. So he was one of the cold stun turtles um, that came in and, and on top of already being cold, he's got a big balloon string in his mouth. Um, and I believe they trimmed what they could. Um, again, you can't pull something out of that esophagus because of the papilla, you could really do some damage. Um, so they waited for it to pass the rest of it and so far it's just been ribbon no balloon but I tell you this guy wasn't so lucky and this guy had ribbon and two balloons in his GI tract this one's stranded this past summer this is endangered Kemp's Ridley these animals are endangered and this is a preventable type of litter this is a kind of litter that people just need to be educated to stop it has to stop and again, it's not just the balloon, it's all those attachments that can be very dangerous to these animals. And why would you put a turtle on a balloon? <laughs> Found two of these since the, the movie has come out. You can see by my face, it does not make me happy. <laughs> I don't know if you all heard this story. This was a say whale that um, stranded in Virginia. Um, and I know the focus is on turtles, but I had to mention this guy. Um, this animal swam around in one of our rivers for a few days, and you know, this is a 50-foot animal. There's really not a whole lot you can do with these guys, um, except monitor it and see what happens. So he actually ev eventually did end up dying and washing up in the stranding. This is after I left. The stranding response program, um, of course, had been monitoring it, and they did the necropsy. And what they found inside of its stomach um, was a piece of a DVD case. A DVD case. So on the picture on the right, that left chunk was what was in the whale's stomach. And then, you know, it took a day or so for people to, everybody to figure out what it actually was, but then they, you know, figured out that it was actually a DVD case. Crazy. I have never seen a DVD case on the beach or floating around. And then wouldn't you know it, like, walks. We found that one. I don't know if any of you are, are involved in, in the whale watches or know about this. Um, the University of New Hampshire, you can actually go on their website when they do their whale watch trips, they record all the debris that they see out there. I just think this is awesome. And they have like 11 years of data. Um, and uh, of all the years, balloons are number one for like seven of them. So um, that the uh, orange, this is the 11 year total. Um, the orange is balloons. So, um, you know, that, that really, again, speaks volumes what's, what's floating around out there. Um, we had a big sargassum event um, where the sargassum weed, which is normally a weed you would find out in the Gulf Stream, um, it's where the little guys hide when they're doing their, you know, their years of growing up. Um, we had a lot of it wash in, and there was balloons and strings just wrapped around the weed. So, you know, they are floating up and they're going away um, because you can't see them anymore, but they're still, they're still around. Um, but I thought this was really cool, and again, you can go on this website and check this out um, if you're interested. All right. Solutions, trashy ladies. I'm one of them. <laughs> um, I have in this business, uh, not just stranding, but just being in the marine debris business, met some amazing, amazing people. Um, this is a cleanup we did on, it's called Fisherman Island, and it's the southernmost island on the Delmarva Peninsula, eastern shore of Virginia. Um, it's not, people are not allowed on it. Dory worked there for a while. People are not allowed unless they're doing um, bird walks and um, it's trashed, it's always trashed. 
just catching everything. We live on the Chesapeake Bay. It's kind of across from the, where the ocean meets the bay. Um, so we did a cleanup. This was in September. That's a fire hose. I don't, I don't, I don't, again, I don't even know how this, some of this stuff gets out there. Um, it's a big magnet for light bulbs. Anyway, so we have this group of women, trashy ladies. I'm going to tell you about a few of them. Kathy O'Hara, I've known um, probably since about 2000. Um, she's awesome. She is my partner in crime when it comes to walking beaches looking for balloons. Um, Kathy actually started the International Coastal Cleanup. She worked for the Center for um, Marine Conservation, which is now the um, Ocean Conservancy. And it's been my privilege to be able to work with this person because she's awesome and she knows so much about plastic. Um, so this little document here was actually the first report um, to NOAA about the citizen science of collecting data for the international, what has become the International Coastal Cleanup. Um, she also wrote a citizen's guide to plastic in the oceans. If you all remember, the six-pack rings used to just be plastic. Um, because of Kathy, they're now photodegradable. So um, when a bird gets caught in it, if it's outside and in the sun, it will eventually break apart. Um, and she played a large part in that. Um, also ocean um, dumping of plastic. She, she helped um, create new laws um, to stop that happening as well. Um, so anyway, Kathy, um, that's her daughter. Kathy's on the right and, and Katie underneath her there. Katie's a senior in College of Charleston now, um, but that was the original Trash Talking Turtle there. So Trash Talking Turtles is a, a way for kids and even adults to kind of um, help give turtles a voice. There's a problem out here um, and this is our problem. So we actually created a how-to guide, how to build your own Trash Talking Turtle. Um, and I presented it at the Sea Turtle Symposium in Mexico a few years ago. Um, kids love making trash talking turtles. It empowers them. It gives them knowledge about this issue. It gives them the feeling that they're helping um, sea turtles. Uh, they're helping the ocean. Um, I think for a lot of kids, their favorite part is actually going out and doing the cleanup to collect trash for their trash talking turtle. Um, for some kids, it's using power tools. The painting, the coming together. I work with an elementary school um, that has four species of trash talking turtle in their school. They know everything about sea turtles. Um, they're like little sponges of sea turtle knowledge and they know that they're what they're each species of turtle they have in their school um, and they have four different types of trash in each turtle so they know that this is a problem. So trash talking tur turtles not only educates the public but it educates the kids as well. This group of students on the top left or both both pictures on the left um, they created four trash talking turtles several several years ago and they went into National Wildlife Refuge visitors centers and they created these um, sign-up sheets that you know people could sign pledge to never release balloons so the trash talking turtles um, guide is actually online and if you're an educator um, and you would like to build your own trash talking turtle you can just go to trash talking turtles org and download the guide and, and create your own and you know you can do what you want with it it's just a fun project it's education um, you know the head is the buoy these girls had their guide and their they were looking at the picture of the loggerhead and they were going to make that head just, that turtle was going to be a loggerhead and, and, and it came out pretty good. Sea tacky down there on the bottom right. Um, so that's my trash talking turtle on the left. Um, he hangs out with me. And uh, on the bottom there, those are two of the sea tack turtles, the leatherback and the green. Uh, and I, actually that's the Kemp's Ridley, filled with bottle caps and the leatherback is filled with plastic bags. Um, the right was another school a friend of mine was at and had his environmental club build one. And then this guy up top here, that's Matthew Nash from Massachusetts DNR, DCR. And he was at the Sea Turtle Symposium and he just thought this was the best thing ever. And he was sorry he couldn't be here today. He emailed me and said, uh, sent me some pictures, but that's his trash talking turtle. And um, he is actually... Um, if you want his contact information, he wants to see more trash talking turtles in Massachusetts. And um, he's got some great programs where kids can go and do beach cleanup and create their own trash talking turtle. And uh, he's a great guy. Um, very Matthew Nash, and he's with DCR. Yeah, he sent me some documents. They do, I 
think he's got like a contest going to see who makes the best trash talking turtle. Um, he had some turtles that were um, the plastron or the shape of the shell was actually just one piece and they were gluing cigarette butts on it and, and making designs with it. And then this girl um, was a volunteer with the um, Fisherman Island National Wildlife Refuge and she was given a bag of 87 balloons that came off of one of the barrier islands. So for her Girl Scout Gold, Gold Award, she made this dress and it's those 87 balloons. And she went around and educated people. Um, she even came to um, couple of my events and that's her down there at the aquarium with a couple of trash talking turtles. Um, amazing, just you know what these kids can come up with. She made a dress. She refused to wear it to her prom. We tried. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another trashy lady, Katie Register. She runs Clean Virginia Waterways and she has just completed the um, marine debris reduction plan for Virginia. Um, we're doing statewide uh, for, uh, marine debris study. We're looking at different beaches throughout Virginia, doing monthly surveys. I got to be the field coordinator for that, which is awesome because I have to go to the beach four times a month, no matter what, even if it's 20 degrees outside, <laughs> um, and look at trash. And um, she's, she runs the International Coastal Cleanup in Virginia and another one of those amazing people that you can just sponge off of and learn so much from and bounce ideas and, and really make a, a changes in the world. Her and I started a um, Virginia balloon study. We put together a Google website and we put up some forms and we said, report your balloons. When you find a balloon, report it on this website. And we've had over 4,000 balloons reported to us without even trying hard. We had no funding, this is volunteer stuff very easy to do if you have the resources to get the word out and you want to start collecting that data because data is so important. Um, actually, this data that we were able to collect between our island walks and this Virginia balloon study, we now have a state senator and a um, delegate that are going to carry a bill um, to ban balloon releases in Virginia. So um, having that data was very powerful and a, a very important component into making change. International coastal cleanup. Who here has participated in an international coastal cleanup cleanup? Okay. It usually occurs in September. It's usually the third Saturday in September. In Virginia, we do cleanups um, all of September and October. You have a data card. You collect data. I mean, these, this is happening worldwide. There's hundreds of thousands of people participating. And as you can see, they picked up 2 million cigarette butts in 2013. Um, and it gives you the top 10 list of the things that were found on, on our beaches, on our waterways. Um, and even cleanups can happen in parking lots, and on schoolyards, um, anywhere, because all drains eventually lead to a waterway. So just because it's called the International Coastal Cleanup, if you're nowhere near the coast, you can still do one. You can lead one, you can participate in one, it all counts because it can all end up in the ocean, even if you're in Ohio. There's waterways, it just all goes, everybody is kind of uphill from the ocean. Um, again, this is Fisherman Island. That top photograph was just taken, um, I think about a month, uh, I think it was a couple days before this cleanup happened. Just plastic bottles, lighters, glow sticks, just crazy stuff. And of course, balloons. That was actually the section of beach. We picked up 125 balloons in a mile. So you can look at those top 10 items and see that most of them are plastic. Cigarette butts, food wrappers, plastic bottles, plastic bottle caps, straws, grocery bags, other plastic bags. Um, so that's seven of them that are plastic of the top 10. Beverage cans. This is the most recyclable thing out there. I mean, a beverage can can be recycled over and over and over again. Plastic bottle, when you recycle that, it's downcycled. It doesn't become another plastic bottle. Um, it usually can become uh, fabric material or carpet, something like that, but then that's it. That's the end of life. Um, so I don't understand why they end up on the beaches so often. Plastic is forever, unless you're burning it, which a lot of um, municipalities do. They burn plastic. Um, we have a burn to energy plant that fuels um, I think it's Langley Air Force Base. So they're burning all this trash. But if it hasn't been burned, it's, if it's in the landfill, if it's on the street, if it's in the ocean, it's not going away forever. Plastic was built to last forever. Even the degradable plastics, <coughs> excuse me, they, what they do is they add a chemical 
and it helps it break down, but it's just breaking down into smaller pieces. It's not going away. Bioplastics, that's different. If it's purely made from plant material, it doesn't have any, um, you know, unnatural plasticizers in it or, um, you know, that stuff can go to a commercial compost. But regular plastic, it's not going away. Um, plastic is made from oil or natural gas, so it's using a finite resource to make it. Very small percentage is actually recycled. Um, they don't know a lot about plastic. They don't know about, a lot about the chemicals that are in plastic. Now you're seeing all these non or BPA free plastics out there. Oh, they're so much safer. Well, what are they replacing BPA with? BPA is what makes plastic plastic. So they're not telling you that. You know, if you're putting plastic in a microwave, stop. You don't know what's coming out of that stuff. There's reports out there. Um, I'm not going to pretend I, you know, I'm a scientist or anything like that, but you really need to look into it. Um, there's a lot of chemicals that can be causing a lot of problems. Um, the biggest thing about plastic is that plastic is meant to last forever, and yet we're using plastic for two minutes and throwing it away. It doesn't make any sense. Why are you using a plastic straw? It came from oil. The oil was shipped somewhere. It was shipped somewhere else to become plastic, probably little plastic beads, and then it was shipped somewhere else to become a straw. And then they probably wrapped it in plastic, <laughs> depending on where it was. And then you stick it in your drink, you sip on it for five minutes, and then you throw it away. It absolutely makes no sense. Um, and again, there is no such thing as a way when it becomes plastic because it just lasts forever. I've kind of gone through the plastic bag and its similarities to jellies and what it's doing in the ocean. Again, plastic bags, when they're exposed to the elements, are breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. And you saw those little pieces of plastic inside those turtle bellies. Um, one million plastic bags are being used every minute. These statistics are staggering and they should bother you. Um, I'm not going to read this to you. You guys can read for yourself. Um, let's see, let's highlight you. The U.S. goes through 100 billion single-use plastic bags. And that's costing all of us money. Like, you get a plastic bag for free. Well, someone's paying for it. Who's paying for it? I would bring my reusable bag, but I'm still paying for somebody else's plastic bag. Um, there's some cities that have banned them all together and other cities that are putting fees on them. Um, I'll take either one. I would prefer the ban, but um, sometimes the fee works too. Um, and there's actually some towns and cities in this area. Uh, I know Barrington, Rhode Island banned them. Um, is it Nantucket has a ban? Provincetown. Provincetown, Provincetown. yeah. Mm -hmm. And some cities are starting to ban styrofoam too, which is awesome. It's got to go. We already talked about the straws, the plastic utensils, it's the same concept. It's coming from the ground, the oil, it's being shipped all over the place, and it's being turned into this plastic fork that you're just going to use for a few minutes and then throw it away. Um, 168,000 plastic utensils picked up during the 2011 ICC uh, in the United States, and 166 straws and stirs picked up in the ICC. I do those monthly surveys, you almost always find utensils and straws. It's pretty amazing that our society has reached a point where the effort necessary to extract oil from the ground, ship it to a refinery, turn it into plastic, shape it appropriately, truck it to a store, buy it, and bring it home, is considered to be less effort than what it takes to just wash the spoon when you're done with it. <laughs> It was a pile, I don't know if you can see the utensils in that photo, I just found that pile, I was walking the dog on the beach, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Someone just left their whole picnic set on the beach. Some of the things that should help you change your mind if you're still drinking out of plastic bottles is that when you buy bottled water, it's costing you more per gallon to buy bottled water than it's costing you to put gas in your car per gallon, um, if you think about it. Especially right now. I mean, it's two thirty-nine a gallon for gas. How much is it for a little tiny bottle of water? Dollar, two dollars, three dollars, depending on where you are. Um, you, they actually, when they're creating the bottle itself, they're using more water than what's actually going into the bottle. And then you guys are probably more familiar with this situation than I am, but is, I, I think it's in Maine, where 
one of the big uh, bottled water companies is pretty much sucking them dry for their water um, to bottle it and ship it to wherever they're shipping it to. So that's another interesting thing to look into. Your tap water is almost free. If you have a container, use it. You, you, you can't even, if you're buying three bottles of water a day, and even if you're just spending $3 a day times seven, that's $21, you know, four weeks, that's $80 a month you're spending on bottled water. One million plastic bottles picked up during the 2011 ICC. It's a lot of bottles. I can't even imagine how many bottles people are just throwing away. What can you do to help make sure this guy girl makes it to adulthood? You all have the power, you know, one of the most important powers that you all have is your shopping dollars. You speak with your money. Um, and when you, when you go to the grocery store and you have the choice between, you know, peppers that are wrapped in plastic for whatever reason or peppers that are not wrapped in plastic, you know, you make that choice and, and the dollars should speak to that um, if everyone's, you know, or enough people are doing it, making that noise. <laughs> All right, I know I'm on video and I'm sorry, Dad, I have to tell the story. <laughs> we went to the grocery store the other night and uh, my dad's a really patient guy and, and um, you know, he's definitely, you know, doing a lot of the things that he hears from me, but um, there's a lot of habit changes that, that you need to actually think about and that actually brings me to my first point here is the number one R, there's a lot of R's, um, but the number one R is rethinking. You have to really start thinking. Picking up a bunch of bananas, the first thing he does is grab the plastic produce bag. Like, what for? It's got its own skin. You know, it's, what do you need it for? When you put it on the little conveyor belt, they're still gonna weigh it. You don't need it. You just don't, and that's, it's just a habit change. I mean, that is just a habit. It's like when you go to the convenience store and you're buying a, a whatever, a can of soda, and the first thing the cashier does is throw it in a bag. I'm like, why? You don't need it. Number two R, it's my favorite R, refuse. When you go to the restaurant, I don't want a straw. I need a glass of water, I don't put a straw in it. I need my margarita, <laughs> don't put a straw in it. <laughs> I refuse that plastic bag. I refuse to buy plastic bottles. I refuse, what else am I refusing these days? Plastic utensils, straws, refuse them. Styrofoam, <laughs> can't stand it. So many restaurants just now, they just automatically put a straw in everything. It didn't used to be like that, but it is now. Um, my favorite restaurant is, um, we have a program called Virginia Green and, and restaurants and, and um, tourist attractions can be certified Virginia Green. Um, and this restaurant, I love them. They have, they do a, a monthly green drinks event and, you know, everybody gets together and talks about, about the environment. Um, they actually participated in a commercial composting program. We don't have a commercial composting facility. It's about an hour and a half away. Um, so there's only one hauler in Virginia Beach that takes compost to this commercial facility. So they got all this biodegradable stuff. Their straws are biodegradable. They're, um, when they, they're, you know, night, nighttime bar scene place also um, they do they have the biodegradable plastic cups and things like that that's okay it's okay um, but they're still using straws and it's it's um, you know it's just, it's just a habit change it's a habit change on the part of the wait staff management and yourself if you you know there's kids out there now it's, it's always the kids that are making the big changes there's kids out there now that are going to restaurants and saying please stop why can't you just ask if they want a straw? Why do you have to put it in every drink? Repair. How many people like, oh my gosh, I dropped my phone the other day. Oh, so sad. On the cement floor and I went, I'm like, please tell me I don't have to get a new phone. <laughs> you know, those, our cell phones are coming from who knows where, using who knows what to make them and who knows who is, is going through who knows what to, to get them to us. Um, so I did end up going to the Warwick Mall and went to the little cell phone accessory place and they replaced it. The, just the glass, the broken glass, $60. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good to know that it could be repaired. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like that, that was the end of that phone. And that was, I was gonna have to go get a new one. You know, just fixing things. Um, you know, people just, 
throw stuff away so easily. We're such a disposable society. Um, <laughs> I was, had a different sweater on, sweater on earlier today. I love thrift store shopping. <laughs> you can get so much, and then you try it on, and it has a hole in the sleeve. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll fix it. I'll put a little turtle patch on it or something, <laughs> you know. I'm glad I brought an extra sweater. <laughs> Dory said, no, you can't wear that. <laughs> so yeah, everything from your electronics to your clothing to, if you can fix it, fix it. We have to stop just throwing things away. And you know, some of that stuff that we throw away is going to other countries and we're making it their problem. That's our away another country. There's a great, oh my gosh, documentary on Netflix, and I can't remember the guy's name. There's all these people that live, I think it's in Brazil, mm -hmm. and they go and they pick through all the trash mm -hmm. and pick out all the plastic things that can be recycled. Kids. Yeah, kids yeah. And this artist has really brought light to that situation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it's just disposable, disposable, it's, disposable. It's Repurpose. Okay, I get, just got this thing. Repurposing. Um, Okay, reducing is really important. We gotta reduce our consumption. We gotta reduce our throwaway habits. Um, you know, repurposing. Uh, some of my green market vendors are just phenomenal with some of the things that they can do. Um, again, with the plastic grocery bags, I have a vendor that takes the plastic grocery bags and crochets them into other, like, purses. It's so cool, just repurposing this stuff. Reuse, reuse, reuse. Again, thrift store shopping. I'm not ashamed. Mostly thrift store, mostly, not all. Um, recycle is last. To me, recycling is an excuse. It's an excuse. Oh, it's all right. If I get that plastic bottle, I can recycle it. You're not recycling, you're downcycling. Oh, I can get that plastic bag, grocery store, recycle it. Recycling, it, it's a necessary thing. It's a good thing. But I still think it should be your last resort. All the other ones come first. My business, Ecomaniac Company, I started with just reusable shopping bags. I started looking at this top 10 list and what are the, other th what are the things out there that need to be replaced with reusable products? Um, and then I, I heard about Beth Terry. She woke up one day, literally had an epiphany and said, I am going to stop using plastic. She did an audit of the plastic that she was using and vowed to cut down to zero. And she's come pretty close. And I actually have the book if you're interested. I'm not saying you can do this or you have to do this. I can't do it. <laughs> but there's some great pointers in here about how to reduce plastic in your life. And she does have a blog too. So, you, you know, it's a book. if you want to buy the book, yeah, sure. But there is a blog um, and it's called myplasticfreelife.com. And you can just go on there and research all the different alternatives that are out there. Even as simple as saving your, your glass, um, you know, pasta sauce jars and then taking them into the Whole Foods and filling them with your bulk food items. With my alternatives to single-use plastics, and I'll just show you guys a few of these, um, sandwich Ziploc bags, again, it's plastic, and so many people just use them once and they throw them away. So I have these awesome snack taxis. You can put your snacks and sandwiches in them. They're machine washable. Or you can just turn them inside out and wash them with the hot water and scrub them down. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't get meat juice in mine. And I don't have to worry too much about whatever stuff meat juice leaves behind. Um, and then this is a sandwich wrap. So there's, um, I have a couple of different varieties of things that you can put your sandwiches and snacks in. I mean, it's just that, it's that little change, you know, that other plastic bags, number eight, most of that is Ziplocs. The plastic utensils, these are utensil sets. I carry one in my purse. I'm not coordinated enough for chopsticks, but I like coffee <laughs> and I refuse the plastic stirrer. So I use my chopstick to stir up my coffee in my insulated clean canteen. That'll keep your coffee warm for hours. <laughs> now I sound like a commercial. <laughs> um, some of our favorite coffee places around here are still using styrofoam cups. A lot of petitions out there to get certain one to stop. I don't know if they ever will. Starbucks, I don't think, uses styrofoam. But if you just bring your, a lot of places will give you a discount if you bring your own mug in. This thing should pay for itself if you're going to one of those places. 
Um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite things, you know, the red solo cup. You get a keg party. I know all y'all are still going to keg parties. <laughs> or if you go into your favorite restaurant and they're using plastic cups, you just take this in with you. Now I do have some problems, and I think I have one left. Yeah, this is my wine, beer, wine, beer. It's a glass straw. Yes. Don't drop it. It will break. <laughs> um, so we have, we actually have hemp cases that you can buy. The case is actually more than the straw, but it, I've, my glass straw sits on the bottom of my purse when I'm using it and, and it's fine. For those of you who are afraid of glass, we do have the stainless steel straws. And then we have straw cleaners. You, this will last you forever. And if your glass straw doesn't get dropped or broken, that will last you forever too. These are cool. These are dog toys, but they're made with plastic bottles. So there's that downcycling at work. When you have your plastic drink bottles, and you recycle them, they go, this is an American company, USA made, and they recycle plastic bottles into dog toys. And I just think that's so cool. Um, this is also American made company, um, Zoe B. She, I met her at a uh, zombie beach cleanup. We like to do those, dress up as zombies and clean the beach or the, we did a cigarette butt zombie cleanup not too long ago with Surfrider Foundation and in eight blocks we picked up 4,000 cigarette butts. So anyway, these are made with corn. They're fantastic anti-plastic dishes, um, not to be microwaved, but they can be put in the dishwasher. And then at the end of their lives, these are for children. I mean, but you know, I, I have this one. I use that this plate all the time. Um, at the end of its life, you can put it in your composter. Um, the Chico bag, these are um, reusable bags. They are made with nylon, but Chico bag will actually take these back when they are at their end of their life. And if you don't abuse it too much, these things should last you for years. Um, their slogan is designed to be unforgettable. It comes in this tiny little pouch that you can throw in your car, throw in your purse. It's even got a little carabiner. If you want to be a total awesome person, you can clip it to your belt loop. <laughs> and then it just kind of packs back into the little pouch. This is like my favorite new thing. It is a deodorant refill. And um, this will fill up, you know, you've got your plastic deodorant container. You've already got it. I have like seven of them because I hate throwing them away until I found this. <laughs> you can put it in the microwave and it softens and you pour it into your deodorant container and it hardens again and you have deodorant. And it's in cardboard, a little bit of plastic, um, and it's locally made and it's all natural. It doesn't have any of that stuff that you don't understand on the ingredients label. Um, and, it, and it works. Um, and then fair trade. If you guys aren't familiar with the concept of fair trade, what that means is that it's usually products coming from developing countries and the people making the product are getting paid fairly for their work. Um, there's a lot of, of um, things that, that companies have to do to become fair trade certified, but this is um, <laughs> one of my favorites, chocolate. Um, this company, Divine Chocolate, is actually farmer owned. So the farmers are growing the beans in Ghana and they're taking them to market and, um, or taking them directly to the chocolate factory and they're getting paid fairly for their, for their work. Um, and you can taste it. You can taste how good they're being <laughs> treated. It's so good. It's a little more expensive, but you don't need as much. Like, and again, the farmers own the company, they're getting paid. And there's fair trade coffee. Um, I'm sure, especially up here, there's locally roasted coffee. Um, there's shade grown, organic, fair trade. Uh, just fair trade is just really important. Um, these loofah sponges are um, made with a plant. It's a kitchen scrubber, so they're biodegradable. They're made with a plant. It's not made with a sea creature sponge. Um, they're made in India, and the farmers, again, are paid fairly for their crops, and the fabricators are paid fairly for their work. Many of you are probably familiar with the picture of planet Earth that was taken by the astronauts in the 70s, and they dubbed that photograph the blue marble. Uh, one of our friends in the sea turtle world, Jay Nichols, has started this blue marble project. He's a sea turtle conservationist. Um, he's actually just come out with a book called Blue Mind, and it's all about how water can help you feel better. It's all about neuroscience, mixing it with um, being one with the ocean, if you will. Um, your, your blue marble, your planet, it's a, it's, it's a blue planet. We're 75% water. Um, you can look at this picture and see that we are surrounded by water. We have to take care of that water and we got to start taking better care of that water. We're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, maybe not us, but maybe I don't have kids, but I have a niece and nephew and I do not want them to grow up in the planet that we're creating and leaving behind for them. It's a mess. Um, so the blue marble is an act of gratitude. 
by giving you all Blue Marble. I'm thanking you all for coming here today. Maybe you learned one thing, maybe you learned a couple of things. I hope all of y'all learned something. All of y'all are kind of thinking about what, what is that one change you're gonna make? What is that one habit you're gonna try to change? So if you take your marble and you hold it, I don't have a whole lot of light here. If you hold it up to the light, this is what our planet looks like from a million miles away. This is what our little blue planet looks like. If you're in outer space looking back down, it's our little blue marble, our little blue planet. Now without the light, it's kind of hard, but when you get home and you get into better light, if you put it up to your eye and you look into that blue marble, it actually looks like you're in the water. There's all these little specks and spots and lines and things like that, and it's just a glass marble. But if you, if you really think about what it would look like underwater, that's what your marble is representing. So your marble is representing our planet and our ocean. And you're going to hold on to that marble and you're going to think about things and you're thinking about that life change that you all are about to make, make commitments to our, saving our planet and our blue ocean and our sea turtles. Jay will make you put your marble up on your forehead. <laughs> so y'all should do that. Where's the camera? Everybody put your marble up on your forehead. So I want you all to start thinking about another person that you may know that also deserves the gratitude that I'm giving you all right now. Someone else that's doing good things for the planet. Maybe they couldn't make it tonight. They might live in a different state. Or you might not know that person, but you might be out there doing a beach cleanup or just walking the beach and you see someone else doing a beach cleanup. As your act of gratitude, you all are going to give that person your marble and you're gonna do the same thing that I just did to you all. And you say, thank you for helping our planet, thank you for helping our ocean, and thank you for helping our turtles, especially our turtles. And if you all want a second marble, because you don't want to give one your only marble away, I have plenty. <laughs> um, yeah, yay!